Hello everyone, bringing a video today which is somewhat different from the normal topics covered on the channel. We're going a lot further back through history than we normally do to the mid 17th century and the English Civil Wars or the Wars of the Three Kingdoms. Something I've had a lot of interest in, um, not something I've previously collected before putting this mannequin together, but something I've wanted to for quite some time. In fact, those of you who've seen the April Fool's video from a few years ago, where I was talking about transferring over to English Civil War stuff, I'd actually started putting some of this kit together at that point with the intention of looking at the topic on the channel. And I've completed the mannequin to a point where I'm happy to talk about it and run through some of the kit that we have on display here. Certainly more interested in foot soldiers than I am in cavalry. Obviously the foot at the time consisted of both pikemen and musketeers, although musketeers were becoming by far the more common. You were seeing uh, a ratio of one pikeman to two musketeers in uh, foot formations and regiments of foot at the time. That was becoming the norm uh, for those who could afford musketeers. Obviously equipping musketeers was a somewhat more expensive business. A firearm is more expensive than a pike, of course. And musketeers used two primary weapons, the matchlock musket, or in some instances, the firelock musket, which used essentially a flintlock. And that was the, the basic uh, long arm, the basic uh, musket used by musketeers. Uh, one of those two designs, the matchlock being by far the more common. What we have on the mannequin here specifically is a setup to represent a soldier, a, a, a soldier, a, a musketeer in the new model army or Parliament's army new model. Now the new model is of particular interest to me. It doesn't directly trace, you know, it doesn't directly form the, 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 the nucleus, the start point of what would become the British army later. Really, that can be traced to the English Army of the Restoration and the regiments of the English Army, obviously, can some of them can trace a direct lineage through to the modern day. The new model army would become, it wasn't initially, but it would become the first standing army in England. Uh, it was initially formed, people think it was formed and knew it wasn't really. It was formed from the combination of existing parliamentary armies and new recruitment. What makes it interesting from my point of view is a large amount of new equipment was purchased for it, including the famous red coats, which of course this is one element which can be traced back to the new model army, which is carried through to the English army and through the restoration, and obviously through to the modern day, uh, with bandsmen and guardsmen still wearing red uh, uniforms. So from that point of view, it does have an influence on the British army going forward with the English army and then the British army going forward. And that's one of the reasons I find it interesting. Other units, other regiments had been equipped by their colonels with matching coats prior to this. So the idea of sort of a uniform wouldn't necessarily have been called that at the time, but the idea of a uniform for a regiment was not necessarily a new thing. But the new model using red throughout, by and large, there were some exceptions. But using red basically as a standard uniform for the foot was a new thing. So we're going to talk about what we have on the mannequin here. Starting at the top, we have a felt hat. Now headgear is something that's somewhat debated. It's likely that some men would have worn other headgear and potentially weren't actually issued headgear. They may well have worn things like Monmouth caps, but the felt hat is something that was certainly issued to the new model later on. There are records of these being purchased and, and issued. So I've included a felt hat here, uh, which is fairly typical of the time. High crown, broad brim, um, with a lot of uh, people associated, of course, with the Puritan movement, but it was a common piece of, of headgear at the time. Moving on down, we have the soldier's coat, and these are all reproduction items, of course, naturally. I will, at the end of the video, run through those bits, which I can, I can still remember where I picked them up from, and let you know who reproduces these, should be, you be interested in, uh, in picking them up yourselves. The soldier's coat is obviously made in a red wool cloth, and then has blue facings on the cuffs, showing that this would be a member of Fairfax's regiment, the, that particular regiment using what were referred to at the time as blue facings. And this is another thing that was introduced in the new model, uh, was uh, regimental facings. So everyone wearing red, but the regiment being denoted by the coloured facings of the cuffs. Now, the contract books still exist, and they give quite a good uh, overview of the kit and the uniform and clothing that was issued. It does also mention in the contract book that the coat used what are referred to as tape strings, which were also in the regimental colour. There's been some debate over whether or not these were for, for actually fixing the coat down the front or fastening the coat down the front rather. In this instance, we have a row of pewter buttons down the front here. It's not clear that the tape strings were used for fastening the coat, and this is based on an extant example. So it's sort of trying to reproduce things as best as we can from the information that's available. Unlike the periods I normally look at, obviously primarily the 20th century, 
But of course, no photographic records. There's very little extant uh, equipment and so forth still in existence. Certainly muskets and armour and so forth have survived a lot better. There's quite a bit of that around. Buff coats as used by the cavalry and in some other instances as well, they've survived. But in terms of basic soldiers' clothing, there really isn't very much around. So quite a lot of this is inference. But nevertheless, trying to go for as accurate a recreation here as possible. So we have the soldier's coat there, not fastening with strings down the front, but fastening with, with buttons there. It's a typical example of uh, how clothing would have been made at the time. Just visible at the collar here, you can see the collar of the linen shirt worn underneath, which has been turned down. So it's worn open at the collar here. This could of course be buttoned up. There is a buttonhole and a button here on the soldier's coat in colder weather. It could be buttoned around to give a little bit of extra warmth. So linen shirt, wool soldier's coat over the top of that. Talking about the equipment, we have several leather belts crossing the chest here. The first one we'll talk about here is the bandolier. Now, bandoliers were the, the common method of carrying ammunition at the time for the musket and we have the powder bottles or charges strung from the front here. Now this is made to a, according to the specification provided in the new model contract books, which specified blue charges and blue and white strings used to secure them there onto the, the leather strap of the bandolier. Each of these could be opened in turn and the powder charge inside tipped into the muzzle of the musket. We then have round on the side there a little leather pouch which carries the lead balls which would be fired and also a priming bottle as well. We'll have a look at that when we move the mannequin round. This other leather strap crossing the chest here carries the soldier's knapsack and we'll see that when we look at the back of the mannequin. That would carry the soldier's personal items and various other bits and pieces. We'll talk about that more in a minute. And we have this wider belt crossing in the other direction and this is a baldric carrying the soldier's sword. Now, musketeers were supposed to be issued with swords. It's clear from records of the time they didn't always have them. We have one on the mannequin here. This is a, uh, a what is referred to in, in collector's terms as a proto-mortuary sword. There's a story to where that name comes from, which I won't get into here. But a period uh, sword carried in a uh, shoulder uh, on a shoulder belt there, basically a baldric. Musketeers would often actually use their muskets as clubs, so they would reverse the musket and use the butt as a club rather than using a sword. And as I say, in certain instances, you would find musketeers, particularly in the Royalist Army, where the equipment and so forth was in short supply, uh, musketeers wouldn't necessarily even be issued with these. But the new model did contract for a large number of swords. I've included one on the mannequin here. That's the front of the mannequin. We'll start moving this around now and have a look at some of the other details. So looking at the right-hand side of the mannequin here, you can see the sleeve coming down, the split cuff there with the blue facing to show the regiment. If we lift this out of the way, you can see the bandolier coming down around here. You have another couple of, another three charges around the back there, excuse me. And then you have a leather pouch here which would carry the, the lead balls for the musket. And a little priming bottle here which has a separate wooden stopper in the top. You can see there that pulls out like that. And this would contain finer priming powder to prime the pan on the musket prior to firing. So you have that there. Let's see if I can get that back in. There we go. With regard to the charges, there's a name for these which is sometimes used, which is the Twelve Apostles. This postdates the English Civil War. I think the first time it turns up in, in writing is the 1670s, somewhere around there. So after the Restoration, uh, it's not a term that was used at the time as far as we can make out, but it's one that's become sort of commonly associated with these uh, since. So that's the, uh, that's the bandolier there, and obviously the, the priming bottle and the extra charges carried round towards the rear there. Looking at the back of the mannequin, we have the soldier's snapsack here, and this is a, a simple leather bag with a, a draw cord at the neck there. This is example, this reproduction is based on uh, period paintings which occasionally show details such as this, contract books and illustrations to try and make something accurate to what would have been used at the time. In this, the soldier would have carried spare clothing, potentially, rations if they were issued and personal items so perhaps a uh, tinderbox uh, for lighting fires and things like this would be carried in here uh, and that would vary a little bit from soldier to soldier it seems that uh, washing and shaving items would generally not have been carried actually shaving yourself was something of a rarity at the time uh, according to all the research that's been carried out you would generally go to a barber and it's possible that a barber would actually have formed part of the army's baggage train so uh, your own sort of washing and shaving accoutrements wouldn't necessarily have been carried in the uh, in the snapsack. So that's a, a sort of a difference from something we're used to looking at on the channel where the soldier carries his entire 
world on his back and, and that includes hygiene items. Certainly washing and so forth was not as common in the 17th century as it would be later on. So personal, personal hygiene was not as good. So you'd actually have a, a relatively limited amount of that sort of thing in the snapsack. The way it's carried here, it does interfere with the bandolier. So if you were going into battle, you'd have to remove this to be able to properly use your bandolier. You're supposed to be able to rot rotate this around the body to get at the charges which sit round on the hip here. So it could also potentially have been carried underneath the bandolier, though that wouldn't have been very comfortable. I suppose it would depend, you know, are you going to have time to dump your snapsack before going into battle? In a set piece, probably. If you were skirmishing, probably not. And that's something that's interesting with musketeers, just to mention very briefly, is they didn't just fight in mass formations on the battlefield. In the English Civil Wars, there was a lot of skirmishing in the hedgerows and so forth. So well, some in individual initiative and so forth being used there, and English soldiers were noted as being particularly good at this kind of, of uh, engagement. So that's the snapsack on the back there. You can see the belts crossing over there for the, the carriage of the sword and for the bandolier, and obviously the back of the felt hat there. Looking at the left-hand side of the mannequin here, if I lift the arm out of the way, you can see the baldric coming down here to support the sword. This is a, a period design of broadsword. Uh, it's possible that the uh, musketeers would have been issued a, a smaller, lighter sword, uh, referred to as a tuck, which is believed to be something closer to a rapier. Uh, but hangers were probably also used and swords like this. It's difficult to work out whether there was a differentiation between swords for pikemen and swords for musketeers and so on. So this is just a period sword. Uh, it's not the best reproduction in the world. It's something I might look at replacing at some point in the future, but it serves a purpose on the mannequin for the moment. The baldric itself is a reproduction based on those found in the Little Coat House collection. And this is a, an incredible collection of buff coats, which are a large, heavy leather coat, which was worn under armor and as armor itself. A large collection of armor, uh, back and breastplates and helmets and muskets as well, but also buff leather baldrics, sword carriages. So this is based on one of those and therefore is quite an accurate reproduction for the kind of thing you would have seen at the time for carrying swords and is certainly typical of 17th century with these two leather loops for carrying the scabbard of the sword there. The scabbard itself is made of wood covered in leather rather than the, the all leather scabbards that would become common later on made of a much thicker gauge of leather. So it is a wooden scabbard with a thin covering of leather and that's carried obviously on the baldric round on the hip as we have it here. There's one other thing I'll mention here. If I just tip the hat over here and raise this out of the way, you can see, if I raise this up here, you'll be able to see there is actually a, a wider leather section to the strap on the bandolier on the shoulder there. This is copied from some excellent examples of new model army bandoliers, which were in the tower collection. They're now in the Royal Armouries collection and that spreads the load a little bit on the shoulder. Uh, so when the bandolier is being carried, obviously it can be rotated around to get at the extra charges. When it's being carried most of the time, that just spreads the weight of the powder and the lead balls where it's being carried on the shoulder. It just gives a slightly wider bearing surface over the shoulder there. So I hope you found it interesting looking at this. I'll just run over where the various items came from. The hat came from the Thimbleby Millinery. Very pleased with that. It's a very nice example and well, well blocked and well manufactured. The soldier's coat and shirt came from the 1642 tailor who make a wide variety of 17th century clothing and the basic soldier's coat is part of their range. Very good value for money for what you get. It's a very uh, accurate reproduction of a typical uh, soldier's coat of the time as far as can be worked out from sort of historical records and what we have. Similar with the shirt, very nicely made. The bandolier itself came from a company called Going Bang. Unfortunately, I believe he's now out of a business as regards making bandoliers he's decided to cease production which is a real shame but that's where that came from the snapsack which we saw on the back on this strap carried on this strap here and the baldric itself as well came from carl robinson leather the baldric is made according to basically according to examples found in the little coat house collection and the snapsack being manufactured based on what can be gleaned from period paintings and illustrations and descriptions in contract books and so forth so again accurate reproductions given the amount of information that's available. For the sword, unfortunately I can't remember the manufacturer of this or where I purchased it from now, but it is a, a, a sort of, if you, if you Google online, you'll find if you look for 17th century broadsword or something like that, you'll find similar. There are other manufacturers of uh, similar swords online. I can recommend uh, looking around, having a good search, 17th century swords, you'll find some uh, different manufacturers online if you're looking to purchase one. So that's where the various items came from. As I say, I do hope you found this interesting. If you have and you'd like to see more from the channel, please do consider subscribing if you haven't already. 
And whether you're newly subscribing or you've previously subscribed, please do make sure you hit the little bell, the notification button down below. That will of course alert you when I upload future videos. If you really like my uploads and you would like to support the channel, you can, both Patreon and PayPal are linked down below. And as ever, a huge thank you to everybody who supports the channel using those two methods. It's greatly appreciated as I always say, thank you all very much indeed. If you'd like to follow the channel on social media, you can. Facebook, Instagram and Twitter are all linked down below. And if you'd like to get in touch but you don't really use social media, there is of course an email address down there as well. That's everything for this video, so until next time, bye for now.